Hey, what's going on, everybody? Um, excited to be back here rocking out with you for a, another segment of our monthly web series. Um, Steve and I are, are excited to, to chat about today's topic. There's this stigma uh, around the, the two commas. You know, when you uh, when you get that second comma, right, uh, you know, people right. start to realize that that's that's real money. Um, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, your first five thousand or your first ten thousand isn't real money. Um, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, is when you're borrowing money and you're borrowing five or ten thousand, the bank looks at that totally different than they look at you borrowing a million dollars. So for sure. it's the same thing outside of banks. It's the same thing in the fintech world. It's the same thing in the you know equipment finance world. And we're going to go into to a lot of it here. Um, you know, what does it take to qualify? What are your uh, you know the common pitfalls? Where are people uh, you know falling short currently? Um, but why this conversation and and Steve, feel free, uh, free to weigh in here some. Uh, today's conversation is really because we're seeing now more than ever, um, you know, the need for borrowing 250000 to $10 million Absolutely. outside of the bank is greater than ever. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I, I don't know what it is. I think banks are just a little bit uncertain. And with that little bit of uncertainty, if it's not perfect, they're not lending. Um, they would rather lend you 15 million or 50 million if you can afford it, right? And if you can't, they're looking at that 10 million and under bucket as, you know, I, I, like sub debt, right? Like almost like outside of what they want to be doing. So because of that, there's a lot of opportunity for people like, our partners that are on this conversation um, and ultimately leveraging resources like the ones we have. So um, we'll go ahead. Yeah, no, just what I was about to say is the, the you know, any if anyone does any um, research at all on this, you'll find what Tony's saying is is right in line with, hap with what's happening currently in the current markets. Um, private credit has been on a, on a substantial growth pattern for the last four or five years and is really, really challenging conventional banking and private equity. Um, what I mean by private credit, I mean, you know, not institutional lenders, not bank level. Uh, these are private groups that pull together uh, funds from a group of investors. Uh, they, they put together a fund and they, they determine an investment mandate, meaning a set of guidelines, a set of capital guidelines that they're uh, capable of lending on, and the, all the all that all those details are typically preset, predetermined. Uh, so when you go apply with a any type of private credit institution, or of course a conventional bank, um, they they have they know their guidelines already, right? So when you go in and you apply with them, they're looking to see if your ratios match their guidelines, if your 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 the specifics of your financing request, your credit package meets their guidelines. If it doesn't. Then unfortunately, it's not that's not a deal that they can lend on. But uh, private credit has expanded that criteria. Um, their their lending uh, criteria and capability over the last several years dramatically. And again, that's why they're uh, posing a significant challenge to uh, conventional banking right now. And a big part of that is just the the need itself, right? Um, when you have borrowers that have real needs and they have assets and they have uh revenue and they can they can afford these things it, it's not necessarily about anything other than access to the capital so when you start to have these private lenders and online lenders that are coming in and filling in these unique niches whether you're talking equipment finance you're talking cre you're talking mca whatever lane you want to talk the lenders in these industries they're there to lend money and that's I right. think that's what makes them so different than a traditional bank is the traditional bank is there to hold your money. That's right. So the well, they're, they're there to trade it. Yeah. More so than anything. Yeah. People forget that. You well, know, banking, right? That's where they make their money. 100%. They make their money on the trade side. Yes. hundred percent. So, so cat, cat, earnings from interest on loans 
um, or Reese's, you know, that's that's bread. And, that's just extra. Very yeah, it, small. Yeah, it's a small portion of how they're actually making their money. It's, you know, a lot of it, it has to do with real estate investment. A lot of it has to do with um, naming rights. You always see like the Wells Fargo Center or Bank of America Arena or, you know, uh, that's where it, your your deposits are going in case you were wondering. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, <laughs> um, you know, and, and then into the insurance world, right? Yeah. Banks are huge in the insurance world. So, um you know, once banks were allowed to own assets like a like an individual, it opened up the world for them to invest, right? And that's what they've done. And you can't blame them for it, but you you need to know what what's the playing field look like, so that when I go out there, I'm I'm putting my best foot forward. And that's what today is all about. So we'll get into the uh, into the presentation here. Ninety two people. See, we were we were joking before because there was only a couple of you on. So shout out to the first few because we were a little nervous there for a second. But now ninety three people. We're getting going. I'm Tony Semino, VP of Business Development here at Rock. Um, we've been going at it for for four plus years now um, under the Rock brand, but we've been funding commercial finance for fifteen plus years. Steve. To my left, who's our director of commercial finance, has been with us almost a year already, which is crazy um, <laughs> to think how really fast, fast that year went. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, has been in the industry, what, 20 plus years now? About 20, yeah, 22 years now. Yeah. And Steve's whole focus, guys, what's what makes the the tandem with the twosome, uh, you know, the gruesome twosome here, <laughs> what makes us, uh, you know, so powerful is um, our complementary uh, product knowledge. Right. Steve comes from a world of where he's been in traditional lending. He's seen what it's like on the back end of working with banks and through banks. Um, and then even outside of that, but more focused in the uh, commercial real estate asset backed uh, types of products, uh, as well as equipment financing. And my own my own experience has been in primarily unsecured financing. So everything outside of what I just mentioned, you're talking term loans, lines of credit, getting cash to business owners directly, right? Um, no assets tied to those products. So we're going to dive in here. A um, little bit about Rock Financial, right? We've been, like I said, rocking and rolling and funding businesses for uh, a good amount of time now. And we we pride ourselves on the process. Um, not to quote the Philadelphia 76ers, but we are totally about trusting the process here. We are tied to the process, not the outcome. Um, if you are a borrower looking for information, we are a great resource for you. You can utilize our website. You can utilize our social media. But most importantly, you can leverage our team, our, our team's knowledge, um, our team that is consistently seeing 10 plus thousand applications per month for funding. Um, and then all the information that comes from having that tool, right? So we know who's doing what, how much money they're approving, what the terms are. Um, and then we give that information back to you guys in forms of great webinars like this one. So today's conversation, question number one, what do I need? Like what qualifications are there for a million dollar business loan, right? Question number two, how long does it take me to get a million dollars, right? And then question number three, what are the products? Right. How do I leverage what's out there, what I have, and ultimately blend between the qualifications of the products and the products themselves? How do I leverage that into getting a million plus dollars? Well, there's going to be a few things, and we're going to go over kind of all of these things. Um, credit worthiness, and these are not in order. Because if they were in order, I would put use of funds first. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. Steve might disagree, but I think he agrees. No, that's a pretty yeah. It's a, it, it, what's the purpose, right? Exactly. Let's start there. What's the goal? What's the purpose? Well, because that'll give us the product, yeah. right? That that's the key here, guys. You don't decide what type of funding is best for you. Your need does, <laughs> right? right? So if you're buying equipment, there's equipment financing, there's cash, right? But you're probably not going to go get a commercial real estate loan to buy equipment. Like that's not smart, <laughs> right? So just understand that, right? Like, and and I know that may sound like basic information, but that's exactly what the, the underwriters are going to do when they look at your, your applications from the businesses you work with. They're going to see, are you checking boxes or are you not? 
right? Well, if you're looking for equipment, we can't give you a commercial real estate loan, right? Um, do you meet the credit? I mean, do you have the assets for something like an AR line, right? If you don't have receivables in your business, if you're a restaurant, unfortunately, there's no receivables, <laughs> you know, um, you have to be in the B2B industry, right? So now we're starting to, to eliminate options, eliminate um, products, ultimately dialing down to now, okay, the products that are available, are you the right candidate to apply for them? And will you ultimately get that approval that you're looking for? But more importantly than an approval is actually getting the funding. And I think that that's another big part of this. You know, I see a lot of lenders these days that will approve deals. I see a lot less that are funding, <laughs> right. you know, they right. you know, when push comes to shove, it's very easy in the marketplace, right? Imagine being a lender. Let me, let me paint a picture for you for a second. You have a borrower that needs half a million dollars, right? And you believe that you're really only going to give them a hundred thousand, right? But you want them to go with your offer. Why not show them a $500,000 pre-approval up front and then based on whatever stipulations you already knew you were only comfortable with 100000 anyway, you're going to rework that thing on the back end. It happens all the time, guys. I'm not telling you information that's that's not readily available for you if you apply for funding these days. So that's where we're seeing through the, the, the lens of all of the information that we have and saying, okay... I see you like to approve deals up to 500,000, but you only like to fund them up to 150,000. Right. And we have the numbers that will tell us that. So if we have a borrower that needs 150, you're the one. But if we have a borrower that needs 500, we're going to have to go with your competition. Even if they move a little slower or they require an additional document or two, they're getting those deals done where you're not. And that's why this is such a, a, a detailed process, right? A million dollars is is you might only have one shot at applying, <laughs> you know, when you apply with the right lender the first time with all the right information, it becomes very easy to get a million dollars, you know, it's when some of these things are out of whack that it becomes, it becomes challenging, right? So number one, use of funds. Number two, I would blend the rest of them. <laughs> yeah, they pretty much go, go, they tie together yeah. pretty well, yeah. Yeah, as far as like the, um, the banks themselves, the the lenders themselves, the people that are going to give you the money, affordability is the next the next thing for them. They're going to look at, all right, at a very base level, when we give them the payment that they're going to have for how much money they're looking for, how does that affect the business, right? If it affects the business negatively, well, they're not going to do it. And believe it or not, if it's too positive, right, if there's too substantial of a change to the business, they don't like that either. They like to sure. see that when you take a million dollars, it's because you needed a million dollars to keep the operation status quo. You know, you might see a 5% bump or a 10% bump in your business, but they don't want to see that you're adding, you know, a whole new product line that you've never done before. And, you know, you might think that that's a great opportunity for yourself as a business owner. And it is. But the underwriter wants to know that regardless of this new opportunity, you're going to be able to pay back this loan. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. So so any any lender is going to look at the potential risk associated with the capital that they're uh, potentially investing and lending in, into the into the uh, into the borrower, into the business. Um, starting something that's brand new is considered to be high risk. You know, the use of, pro this is kind of like the back to the use of 100%. proceeds, right? It's got to make sense, right? 100%. Like if they see that this is a brand, basically almost like, like a start, a, a, a side business that you're developing into your existing business. Well, they want to know, you know, you have experience with that. Yep. You have a solid plan for this. You have everything, everything makes sense, mm -hmm. basically. That you, you, you know what you're doing. You're going into the project with a good understanding of, of what you're doing. And even so, even with you know sufficient experience and a solid business plan, again, if it's a, a brand new endeavor, it doesn't really mold well into your existing uh, model. Well, it's 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 absolutely high risk, and it's it's, it's it becomes no extremely difficult. Success. Yeah, it becomes extremely yeah. difficult to get access to that type of capital. So, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you be careful what you tell the the underwriters, right? Like that's that's the wrong piece of advice. What I'm telling you is make sure that when you're applying for funding, you have a clear, precise plan that is going to utilize that capital in a way that is not going to 
create major waves. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm telling you. It should be status quo, right? Um, if you're borrowing a million dollars, it shouldn't be because your business only does $60,000 a year. And if you only had a million, you could do 10 million. Well, this is an investment. This is the, the lending industry is not built on, on the chance takers. You know, that's a, their bet, their, professional gamblers yeah. <laughs> essentially the, yeah. the underwriters are professional gamblers and they're uh they're taking a look at the risk and their the reward and they usually overprotect themselves that's that is 100 percent certain you know and and it's smart to know that as a borrower right because you can leverage their capital um you know that's the that's the the upside to it right um you know i was able to buy my house because i was able to leverage capital that was not mine you know uh regardless of what the interest rates were or where they were going or what everybody was saying at the time i still bought a house in the last 24 months um you know it, it's when you need it you need it um credit worthiness this is one that i wanted to point out really quick before we go to the next slide just because you have a multitude of different kinds of credit worthiness worthiness, excuse me, <laughs> I can't even say that. Um, and where I want to start with this is to just kind of expand your thought process a little bit, because everybody goes right to their FICO credit score, as you should. If you're a, a sub 500 borrower, getting a million dollars is probably out of the question. Um, you know, if you're a 650 borrower, now we're starting to get there. If you're a 700 plus borrower, you have a much better chance where we're starting to get to where we need to, to, to be as far as like personal FICO goes. Right. Um, but it's bigger than that. If you're talking about a property purchase, uh, whether it's commercial real estate, it's residential investment, whatever. Um, if it's a million dollar purchase or, or refi or whatever it is, part of that credit worthiness is the actual property itself is the appraisal that they're going to do, is how recent was that appraisal. All of that is part of the credit worthiness. If you're talking equipment financing, it's the equipment itself. The equipment itself becomes part of it. And where is that equipment tiered, right? Like you may be saying to yourself, like, what is Tony talking about? Well, if you're a dentist, right, and you're going to outfit your whole office, the tiers of equipment are going to be much different. For example, the seat that they sit in, in your office is going to be one. The x-ray machine that you use is going to be in a different tier. The little thing that you use to, you know, suck all the saliva out is going to be a different tier of types of equipment. And based on where that invoice adds up and the different types of equipment, that's going to give you the overall credit worthiness of that application, right? that all becomes a part of this when you start to tie assets in, when you start to tie the business in, there's business credit, there's personal credit of the owners. Um, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into credit worthiness. Additionally, I mean, one of, one of the things that gets overlooked very often is even if you have a strong credit score, you could have a 750 plus credit score, but if you don't have depth of trades or you haven't ha had any established trade lines that are similar uh, to the, the type of trade line that you're requesting in terms of amount or monthly payment. And usually the, the lender is going to use a ratio. It doesn't have to be dollar for dollar, but you know they might say, hey, it's got to be, a, you have to have at least one trade. This is very common with equipment financing. You have to have at least one trade for, let's say, and again, every lender is different, but uh, one trade that's at least half of the original balance is at least half of the uh, invoice amount or the total financing request. So if you're going in and you're asking for a million dollars, um, and it's one of these, you know, non-bank equipment lenders that has these types of guidelines where they're looking at, uh, you know, uh, prior trade line activity. Yep. You know, again, that would mean if their their guidelines specify that they want to see at least one active trade open for at least a twelve to twenty four month period for at least half the original balance being at least half of the uh, financing request. You're asking for a million. That means you have to have at least one trade line for half a million open for at least twelve to twenty four months with no late payments. That's the other key no late payments. If the pay, if that trade has any late payments on it during that time frame, then that trade line cannot be counted or considered towards the underwriting process. Um, so that, that gets overlooked very, very often, as you noted, yeah, too. pay absolutely. net, pay net just as important. So you could have, a, you could have a borrower. We just had this happen. Uh, we had a borrower looking for SBA financing, um, phenomenal personal credit, seven, like a 780 plus score, plenty of depth of trades, 
excellent cash flow in the business. The Paynet score came back abysmal. I think I want to say, I don't remember exactly what it was. I want to believe it was below, I believe it was below 640. Or uh, depending on which one they ran, it was it was it was it was not great. It was it was subpar, and that alone blew up the deal. That that pay net score blew out the deal on its own. So um, yeah, so lenders on a commercial level, on a business level, lenders are looking at personal credit, depth of trades, and uh, pay net business credit. All all are significant to the underwriting process. Two hundred percent. So we just touched on this a lot. <laughs> But just to kind of summarize it for you again, right? The ability to repay the loan, right? Regardless of the scenarios, um, you know, if, if things worked out with the deal, if they didn't work out, right? If whatever, you have to be able to repay. They're looking to lower the risk by any means. So if you have assets, they're going to look to over protect themselves on their investment, right? So they're going to look to tie those assets to this type of this type of deal. And one of the things that I want to make very clear is where does this level start, right? Um, it's different for every lender, but like when you're talking about a million dollars, anybody that's lending a million dollars, this is what the the system looks like, right? Um, for some lenders, it's over 150k that they become full package, right? Right or full pack. If there is a um, another lender, it might be two hundred and fifty thousand. Some lenders now we're we're getting less and less. It might be three hundred or three hundred and fifty thousand. Then there's very few that that number is five or six hundred thousand. When you start to talk about the people that are giving you a million dollars, it's a small bucket. Yep. The industry they they work together. The industry is small. Yeah, and it's and it's always a full pack, exactly. Um, you know, so just keep that in mind as you're, you know, as you're applying or as you're thinking about working with borrowers who need this much money, right? Um, so we touched on this a little bit, right? Um, secured lending, unsecured lending, uh, some of what Steve's uh, prior experience was versus where um, my own has been. And I wanted to just make sure that we had a slide that that really went over that for you guys to show, hey, they're they're different arms, right, with two hands, but both hands wash the face, right? Um, you know, <laughs> Good analogy. yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, just keep that in mind. You know, when you're using this, um, what we see a lot of times is borrowers who will combine some of the uh, some of the different scenarios right where they may say hey i need a a certain amount of capital for equipment i'm buying this five hundred thousand dollar piece of real estate and i have a need for one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars in cash right so they'll use a couple of different products right there may be a commercial real estate piece there might be a, a line of credit piece or a term loan piece there might be equipment financing all of this might get wrapped up with an SBA inside of six to nine months, depending on what the long-term process looks like, right? So I just want to keep that in mind as we go through the next few slides. Uh, uh, not only are these products interchangeable in terms of a, a million-dollar request a lot of the times, but you'll also see them be used in tandem to get somebody to where they, they need to be. Um just keeping the uh, the presentation going here, right? Um, I, I told you we were going to go over some of the common mistakes, right? Number one, I would say, is this not enough collateral? Absolutely. Right? And what does that mean? Well, one of the biggest things that people forget is when you look at an, from a, an accounting lens, you look at cash in a business, cash is an asset. Assets are where collateral comes from. So if you don't have enough cash, right? I know not profitable is also on here, but like if you don't have enough cash on hand, well, they're going to see that. They're going to see that you can't really afford the loan. And then obviously there's all the other assets, right? I, we talked a lot about overprotection. So if you're looking at somebody and they do have AR and their AR is paying, well, somebody's going to look to scoop up that accounts receivable, right? They're going to want to put a lien on that just to protect themselves, right? Now, if they're a borrower who's looking for a million dollars and all they have is 250000 worth of receivables, well, that's not 
probably enough, depending on how quickly they're turning that and how quickly, you know, things are looking. But for the most part, 250 isn't going to get you a million. So you have to remember that, right? If you're talking about a property, you can't get a million dollars on a property if it's worth 600 grand and you owe 500,000, sure. you know, and, and I know that, uh, you know, for a lot of people on this call, that may seem like, you know, simple information, but there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I, I just want to be very clear about like, when I say not enough collateral, I'm talking about you have to actually be over and above if we're talking the collateral world. Now, Certainly. same thing in the cash world. <laughs> you want to go get a million dollar cash advance or term loan or, you know, line of credit from somewhere, you're going to need a substantial amount of cash to qualify for a million dollars. You know, that's really what it comes down to. Poor credit, automatic no. Um, you know, I, I would say as far as, you know, the SBA is concerned, you can get as low as like what, like a 640? 650, yeah. 640 in some cases. Yeah, we're pushing. Yeah. I mean, and in those cases, you need compensating fat. Something else has to balance out the lower credit score, like really strong cash flow, strong collateral, something there that really, you know, boosts and carries a great use of funds. Right. Averages out the low weight. Yeah. Yep. Use of use of proceeds if they're they're taking, you know, the consolidating debt and their debt service coverage ratio is going from a a 1.05 to a two, you know, that's a major compensating factor. Yep. Things like that. Will yeah. Help. Buying real estate in there, you know, that'll, that'll help. Um, again, that's probably the bare bones minimum across the board here. You know, if you're going to qualify for an AR line of a million dollars and they pull your credit and they see that you're, you know, 620, it's going to be tough. You know, Certainly. it's, it's going to be tough. Um, you know, I would say you're looking 650 minimum, you're looking, you know, uh, at you have to be making a, a good amount of money. You know, fifth, fifth the magic number when we're talking about conventional or uh, any type of secured type of loan where it's where there's a cash flow parameter, a cash flow driver in the underwriting guidelines. The magic number is fifteen percent more EBITDA than proposed debt. So what I mean, what do I mean by that, right? If EBITDA is 115,000 annual and total debt, meaning the debt that we're proposing plus any other existing debt, if they have an equipment loan, if they have, um, uh, you know, so any anything, any any other type of working capital loan that we're not going to pay off through our loan proceeds, then the total combined annual payments for that debt would not be able to exceed 100,000, right? So if we have 115,000 in EBITDA, and we have 100,000 in total proposed annual payments on the debt, total debt obligation. 115 is 15% greater than 100. So that's that's the magic number. 1.1, that's the same thing as saying a 1.15 DSCR. So anything more than that means that you're in pretty good shape in terms of, of cash flow. And that's going to be, you know, I, I know the last few, right? Uh, not enough time in business, no business checking account, right? These, these seem like, you know, simple factors. But again, it, it's common mistakes. You wouldn't believe how many people are, are making a lot of money, but they're using a personal checking account. Like we see it all what, the time. One note, I just want to come yep. back to that slide, if you don't mind, Tony. Tony, I don't even know if you realized it, but what, what we just outlined here are the five C's or the five pillars of credit and underwriting. So not enough collateral. Collateral, that's one of the main points of underwriting. What's the collateral? What's the asset that we're leveraging? Poor credit, credit or character. That's one of the other C's, right? And obviously we're talking about their credit rating, personal credit, as we talked about, paying that as well. Depth of trades as well, as we noted before. Profitability, that talks about cash flow, the ability to service the debt payments, the debt obligation. Um, not enough time in business. This is what we refer to as conditions. So use of proceeds, uh, the potential rate is the rate 20%. I mean, where, where that's exorbitant, would, would that make sense for the lender? Uh, is that posing too much of a high risk for the borrower to afford? Uh, the loan amount, is it just simply too high for the for the type of, of business that we're working with? The industry, maybe the industry is specifically struggling a bit. Transportation right now has been struggling in the last several years. So that's all part of um, the conditions part of the deal. Bank account, uh, we're talking about uh, ca uh, capital, cash on hand, reserves, so if they have a, you know, if they have twelve to twenty four months of reserves on hand at all times, well, that lowers the risk quite a bit. They could go through a couple of a couple of months of a yep. downturn and still survive. Yep, exactly, hundred um, percent. 
so just to kind of clear it up, right? Um, you know, if you're going to go get a, a million dollars, and this is this is minimums. <laughs> I want you to know, like, this is minimums. I'm not guaranteeing you're going to go get a million dollars if you meet this. Um, but I'm guaranteeing that you can apply for it. And, you know, with the right guidance and with the right, uh, you know, the right mixture of products and, you know, the right use of funds, you can get there. Um, but this is the bare bones minimum. You know, we were talking about it just a couple seconds ago, 620, 640, 650. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty much, you know, the bare bones minimum on the credit side. Um, you know, we're seeing anybody that's going to get a million dollars, they got to be doing three, five, $10 million annually. Um, you know, it, it, they're, they're real businesses that have real problems or real opportunities. Um, and that's what they're using the million dollars for. It's, you know, it, it, it's a big, big part of it. Um, now why we're talking about it again is because most people aren't servants service in this part of the market at the moment, right? So what does it look like to, to service the market? Well, this is what it looks like, right? You know, you have these scenarios where businesses that have been around for a few years, they have, you know, a uh, uh, true use of funds, right? Um, you know, the first success story here, decline at their local bank. This is the one that we're hearing the most of right now. Uh, maybe it's because most of our partners are, are ex-bankers or, you know, business bankers and relationship managers, but we're seeing a lot of the decline at their local bank um, and, and are using the money to as a bridge, right? Whether it's to um, finish a project, start a project, um, you know, it's to pay off vendors, uh, you know, uh, just kind of keep things going in the right direction, getting them access to to more capital, right? Um, you know, what, what comes from finishing a project is cash, right? <laughs> you know, it's, you know, when you finish that project, you know, the million dollar loan, all of a sudden, it, you know, the, the loan was taken to finish the project. And, you know, we could be talking about three, five, $10 million of, you know, access to, to capital going forward or revenue in their business, you know, when you're you're talking about the right thing here. Um, the one in the center, professional services, you know, we hear it time and time again, the 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 insurance companies don't make it easy to get paid. Um, so this borrower here, they were switching some things on the back end with some of their service providers. Um, and because of that, they had a lapse in their their uh, ability to collect payments from uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. That's right. And it was one of their major uh major ways of uh, of earning um you know medical staffing the past few years has been one of the biggest industries um and because of that you have a borrower here who needed the capital to continue to pay to continue to operate their business right like you know when you're you're talking about a, a business like staffing the best thing that you have are good recruiters and a team of people that are out there, you know, doing this for you and, and ultimately delivering that product on the, you know, on the back end. Well, if you're waiting to get paid on the front end and you can't afford to pay your staff, well, it's only so long that you're going to have a business, right? right? So, um, you know, it, it becomes very important to to access this stuff and, and get access to the funds. Yeah, and in this particular case, this this is a business owner that's been in play, been in a medical medical facility. It's been in place for many years. Uh, very strong borrower had an issue, not not any issue that he created. He had an issue with his his medical billing provider, his third party billing provider. Um, about about six to twelve months, I want to say, before we he went in for the application. And that issue, it actually created a butterfly effect for him, which was pretty, which could have been pretty severe if he had not uh, connected with us. Um, he had a, a several million dollar line of credit with his bank, a conventional bank. Uh, that bank was looking to terminate that that loan. They were not looking to extend the terms on that loan because of the cash flow, the minor cash flow issues, temporary cash flow issues that they experienced as a result of the medical billing issues. Uh, with their third-party provider, uh, so we were able to come in and leverage their AR, which which we were able to work around any of the AR with that wasn't affected by the medical biller. Uh, really, but that was anything that was billed within the last six months out. Uh, leveraged the AR, got him the funds he needed, gave him some additional working capital on top of it, and uh, it was all set. I mean, it was it was a time crunch for sure, dealing with the the uh, timeline that the bank provided for exit of the existing loans. 
But again, using the right collateral, we were able to structure the right credit facility to help the borrower. Yeah, absolutely. And then this this last one here, the, the trucking uh, example, this is a good way to just show how you can use um, multiple options or multiple, uh, you know, multiple products to, to meet what you're looking for, right? So this customer here was able to leverage their existing fleet of trucks, knowing that they're going to continue to purchase uh, equipment and they leverage their existing equipment to get access to a line of credit that will allow them to purchase more going forward. Now, immediately they were buying, I think it was either three or five trucks and trailers immediately on the line. There was a need for them to add to the fleet. So what else did they take? I believe it was 250,000 on a on a line or 350,000 on a line of credit um where they were able to get access to working capital on top of this, right? Um so that's how we get to the 1.5 million is because they're able to utilize that line of credit and draw on it and pay it down, draw on it and pay it down as they're hiring new employees and bringing, you know, increased increased payroll. Um you know, it's just there to 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 be a reserve for them. So um, this, this was a, like a hybrid uh, equipment line yep. and a working capital line, if I remember correct. correctly, right? Yep. Yeah, yep. correct. Where they were able to leverage their revenue separately from the equipment transaction. That's right. Yep. And, and that's, you know, that's the beauty of working with a broker, honestly. You know, if you would have went directly to the equipment finance lender, they would have serviced your need. If you would have went directly to the, the working capital lender, they would have serviced your need. But um, it, in a broker seat, we're able to help put the deal together, you know, and it's, it, a perfect example of structured finance. Yeah. And, and again, with creativity and on the broker level, we have the and variety, access to a variety of different lenders with different options. You know, we have the ability to get creative like that. Absolutely. Um, so just a couple of things, right? Why are you here if you're new to us? Uh, or, or And I see a couple of questions already in the Q&A about some of these things. Um, but, you know, as far as what are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about partnering with Rock, right? If you're somebody that is a partner with us already, shout out to you for being on this and, and you know, coming back month after month and, you know, being a part of our web series. Uh, but the other part is people that have never worked with us before. So just to give you a quick overview, why do partners work with Rock? Um, number one, it's the rock stars like Steve and I. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, it's everybody else. Um, realistically, it, it, it's all the other rock stars on the team. Um, you get direct access uh, to multiple points of contact throughout the team. Um, and, and the reason that I keep saying the word team is because that's what you're joining. You're you're getting uh, your own commercial finance team. I, I always tell every partner that signs on with us, uh, you just congrats because you just became the CEO of your own commercial finance brokerage. How would you like it to operate? Um, and, and that's the beauty of our partnership. We have the technology to back that um, and give you the, the most seamline, uh, streamlined uh, process out there from taking your deals from application to approval and approval to funding um, and ultimately providing an uh, extremely aggressive uh, referral commission based on how much volume you're able to produce with us. Um, there's residual opportunity, there's investment opportunity, there's the ability to get paid more on the upfront, there's you know all, all sorts of different things there. So if you're interested, I would tell you, make sure that you reach out to us and partner with us now, um, because that's really what it's all about. Um, I wanted to do something a little different here, and this is a new thing that I think we're gonna put in going forward, but I reached out to the team and said, you know, we all work with hundreds of partners. What are some things that make a good partner, right? Because I think sometimes we talk about how great of a partner we are. Well, it's got nothing to do with us. It's got everything to do with how our partners use what we have, right? So I reached out to a few guys on the team here. Um, you might be working with with some of these guys. You may have spoken with them in the past. Um, you know, shout out to these four for, for providing some feedback. But, you know, what's resounding to me behind this is I noticed it's more about communication than anything. Um, those partners that just have a real conversation um, are able to really take advantage of the different resources that we have, right? So, you know, um, like Nick mentioned, you know, the best way to achieve success is by collaborating when connecting with Rock to your clients, 
right? Uh, whether that's the intro call or gathering docs, you as a partner can say, hey, listen, when you work with Rock, you're going to speak with a representative who's going to walk you through your transaction, right? You may think that that doesn't go a long way. I can't tell you how far that, that actually goes, um, you know, or it's like Justin mentioned at the bottom, it's being able to service their clientele while also leveraging the different products that we have on our platform. So we have a lot of different partners who they sell different pieces of equipment or they sell commercial real estate or they, they're they involved in transactions where there's a huge value add into being a partner along with the fact that they're going to make, you know, the commissions, which are, you know, high paying, right? So um, it's all about working together. It's all about really... Um, doing what you know what everybody can to to ultimately get a deal through the finish line um there's more reasons that deals don't get done than there are that they get done uh, that's the one thing i always i always remind the sales teams sure. and the, the guys on the sales floor is because um you know sometimes it's out of our control it's the borrower it's the lender uh it's the guidelines it's the government it's you know whoever right if we're talking sba it's you know, it's a little bit of all of them, <laughs> but, uh, you know, realistically don't be the reason that the deal doesn't fund. Right. And, and, you know, if you can have a really solid rock solid partnership, as I would call it, um, that streamlined process between us and yourself really allows the back end of everything else to work together. Um, so if you're somebody who is looking for more information, you're not sure yet, or if you're like, Tony, stop talking. I just want to sign up. This is the link for you. Um, please pull out your cell phones. I know it's 2024. Everybody got them. Scan this link here and it will take you directly to becoming a partner. Now you get access to our directly into our CRM through our, my partner portal, uh, where you'll have uh, be able to go through your pipeline, get access to training, marketing materials, custom landing pages, white label experience. Um, how many how many benefits you think I could list? <laughs> I, think, I think we could fill several pages. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, it, please, if you're new, let's rock out together. Um, if you're not new or you are new and you're wondering, all right, how do I stay up up to date on this stuff? Social media is probably the most important area. Um, every one of us have our own social media. This here is a chance for you to follow the rock social media uh, where you'll get daily business tips, sales tips and tricks, um, how we market our products, what partnerships we're looking for at um, all different types of things, whether it's regulation related, whether it is product information related, we make sure that anything that's happening in commercial finance and fintech, you're you're aware of by following us on social. So um, make sure uh, that you're following us and we will follow back. Right, ladies? We're following back. All right, good. <laughs> they gave me the, they, yeah, they gave me the, they gave me the head shake from behind the camera. So we're good. Um, I think we're we're kind of getting there. Um, if you're somebody that doesn't want to wait, right? Feel free to call us now, 833-3-ROCK-BIZ. That's 833-3-ROCK-BIZ. I feel like I'm on the radio when I say that. Um, but no, uh, feel free to to check us at, check out our website. You can email us. Um, you know, one thing I want you to know is we're real people. Uh, we're here to really talk with you, have real conversations, um, and we're excited to to get a chance to to connect with you. Uh, the 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 one thing I want you guys to keep in mind is we're going to be back here again next month, giving you more information, giving you more insight. I want to thank Steve for, for joining me again. I want to thank you guys for, for rocking out with us for over an hour. Um, and thank you for your questions. Thank you to everybody that put this thing together um, and make sure you're keeping an eye out for uh, the announcement about our next webinar. And we'll check you guys back here next month. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Tony, for being an iron host here as well. <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you all.